Okay, <coughs> good evening, surgeons. Um, this is uh, Dr. Mahesh Ronaidu. We are doing another live stream broadcast uh, for FCS2 registrars in preparation for the upcoming FCS2 exam. Uh, please just give me an indication on WhatsApp if you are tuned in and if you are receiving sound and audio, sorry, video and audio, and if there are any problems. This evening we are going to be talking about endoscopic intervention in the upper GIT and um, there's quite a few areas uh, that we're going to look at. Um, endoscopic esophageal procedures, uh, this has been presented previously and the video is available on YouTube and Teachable. Uh, but we are just running through it again today. Uh, we are going to be looking at um, esophageal dilatation, stenting, banding of varices, uh, Hiller's myotomy, and um, the subsequent lecture we will cover esophageal pouches, fundoplication, and uh, esophageal substitutes. We will also be looking at upper GI foreign bodies today, endoscopic management of bleeding peptic ulcer disease, uh, bleeding esophageal varices, POEM, uh, which is an interesting endoscopic treatment for echelasia. It's per oral endoscopic myotomy. That's what POEM stands for. We have a little video clip on that. And I will be showing you endoscopy and corrosive ingestion, what, uh, what it actually looks like. Okay, so we will start by looking at esophageal dilatation and stenting. Um, this brief video is uh, produced by a manufacturer, but it actually explains the product quite well. Esophageal stenting. Esophageal obstruction may be caused by stenosing esophageal cancer, external involvement by lung cancer, or compression from lymph node enlargement. The Aegis esophageal stent has a unique design resulting in superior performance. The knitted skeleton allows free conformability to the anatomy of the esophagus and compliance with peristalsis. This results in markedly reduced migration, even when placed across the gastroesophageal junction. Good stent fixation is further achieved by the large double-stepped stent heads. The absence of straightening forces reduces pain and the risk of pressure necrosis, while achieving slow and gentle dilation through the shape memory effect of the nitinol skeleton. The EPTFE membrane excels through durability and flexibility and allows easy stent removal, even after several weeks of stent implantation. Retrieval lassos for stent removal. This may be done in a conventional fashion via traction from the upper end or in an even less traumatic way by stent inversion through capture of the lower retrieval string. An optional anti-reflux valve reduces regurgitation and aspiration of gastric content for stents placed across the gastroesophageal junction. A catheter and hydrophilic guide wire are placed from the mouth through the stricture into the stomach. This may be done under endoscopic or fluoroscopic guidance. The patient should lie in a prone or lateral position to reduce the risk of aspiration. After removal of the guide wire, the stricture is outlined by injection of a water-soluble contrast medium through the catheter. The 
CNG Biotech calibrated Song Lim coil catheter will allow more accurate assessment of the stricture without the need for withdrawing the catheter above the stricture or removing the guide wire, thus reducing procedure time. The catheter is passed well beyond the tumor. A super stiff guide wire is inserted and the catheter removed. The delivery is advanced over the stiff wire and the stent positioned across the stricture. Radio opaque gold markers allow accurate stent positioning on fluoroscopy. A yellow marker on the delivery system allows deployment under endoscopic control. The stent should extend beyond the edges of the strictures by at least 2 centimeters. The delivery sheath is unlocked and slowly withdrawn while maintaining stent position. The delivery system and guide wire can be removed at this point. If the degree of stent expansion needs to be assessed more accurately, this can be done by further injection of contrast or endoscopically. However, care needs to be taken not to displace the stent by advancing the endoscope through it. Nitinol stents reach their full radial force only after warming to body temperature and will continue to expand for several days. Balloon dilation should be avoided. Your local SNG Biotech rep. You know, that was uh, quite an instructive video. It shows the actual stents. It was um, more of an animation, but it does explain uh, the procedure very clearly. Um, the stents that we use, typically made by Boston Scientific, are usually wrapped with silk. They don't have a cover like the one that was shown on this video. They're wrapped with silk, and you basically withdraw the silk or pull the silk um, from outside the patient and it unravels and releases the stent and it allows um, the benefit of using a thread like silk is it allows a proximal release or a distal release. Um, the method that you saw in the previous video only allows for distal release. Um, okay, so there's some advantages and there's some surgeons that prefer one method um, over the other. Okay, this um, is a fairly brief video and actually shows um, endoscopic view um, of placement complication, complications and some tips and tricks. Esophageal stents are commonly utilized for a variety of purposes and in modern clinical practice. The most common indications for the treatment of malignant dysphagia, stents can be placed in pre-operative and non-operative candidates. Other indications include the treatment of benign esophageal strictures, fistulas and leaks. The representative stent deployment will now be shown, focusing on the endoscopic view. The patient in this case has a very proximal esophageal cancer. There is complete obstruction of the esophagus and the endoscope cannot pass into the distal esophagus or the stomach. The guide wire in this case, a straight biliary guide wire through a straight biliary catheter, is advanced through the tumor and access is obtained to the distal esophagus and stomach. The stent is then advanced over the wire and deployed. Because the tumor is very proximal in this patient, an effort is made to overlap the proximal end of the stent to the very proximal end of the tumor as much as possible. Here you can see them withdrawing the silk. After stent deployment, the delivery catheter and associated guide wire can be removed from the patient. The stent can then be inspected for position, patency and signs of any immediate complications. You can see the stent is in excellent position. Tumor is visible through the stent entrance. The stent is widely patent.
representative stent deployment will now be shown emphasizing the fluoroscopic view. In this patient, the endoscope could be advanced through the tumor to the distal portion of the mass into the gastric cardia. This position is marked endoscopically with an image. The endoscope is then withdrawn to the proximal aspect of the tumor and an image is also obtained. Thus, the distal and the proximal end of the stricture are then clearly marked. A wire, in this case a sabri wire, is advanced through the tumor and into the stomach and the endoscope is removed over the wire. The stent, in this case a fully covered stent, is advanced across the stricture, the distalmost portion of the stent, below the bottom of the tumor. Final adjustments are made, deployment is allowed to commence. In this patient, the stent is deployed in a distal proximal manner, as is most commonly performed. The stent is fully deployed, clearly bridging the entire tumor. The delivery catheter and its guide wire are then removed from the patient, and the stent is left in place, bridging the entire tumor. Endoscopic inspection following deployment usually reveals a fully deployed and well-placed stent. Here you see a fully covered stent in good position across a tumor. The tumor is visible through the stent. Through and through endoscopic evaluation of the stent is not required post-deployment, but can be performed if desired. Here you see a retroflex view of the distal stent. Endoscope is then straightened and removed through the stent. The distal portion of the stent is in good position in the gastric cardia. The stent is patent without signs of complication or other difficulties, and the proximal end of the stent is above the proximal end of the tumor. If clinically indicated, a stent can be placed in the very proximal esophagus. This requires very precise placement by the endoscopist. Here you see a fully covered stent placed immediately below the upper esophageal sphincter and a patient with a very proximal cancer. This patient tolerated the stent well. Complications can occur. In this case, you see an infolded stent immediately after deployment. Infolding can occur due to poor placement, incorrect stent size, or maybe a sign of a non-compliant tumor. The stent can be left in place, removed, or manually adjusted to allow complete expansion. Stent placement can be adjusted following deployment as needed. A rat tooth forceps allows for rapid and efficient stent adjustment in most cases. This video shows the use of a rat tooth forceps to proximally adjust the position to fully cover an esophageal stent. The stent is moved approximately for a distance of two centimeters. When the stent is felt to be in adequate position, the rat tooth forceps release the stent and the position can be directly assessed endoscopically. If satisfactory, no other adjustment is required. Some stent migrations are associated with recurrent dysphagia and warrant stent replacement. At other times, stent migration is a sign of response to neoadjuvant therapy. Stent migration is unfortunately a common development following deployment, especially with fully covered stents. Most migrations can be managed endoscopically. This video illustrates complete migration of an esophageal stent into the gastric cardia. The stent is grasped by rat tooth forceps around the proximal retrieval string if possible. The stent is then withdrawn through the tumor and the esophagus with the rat tooth forceps. Note here that when the endoscope is removed from the patient, the stent has come off the rat tooth forceps. The rat tooth forceps have been withdrawn back into the endoscope and the patient is reintubated. The stent is located just below the level of upper esophageal sphincter. The endoscope passes into the proximal esophagus. The stent is grasped, again with the rat tooth forceps, by the retrieval string and removed from the patient. Other complications, including tumor ingrowth and overgrowth, can be treated by stent within stent placement. 
Perforations are rare, but can often be managed by other stent placements. Yeah, that was also a very useful video and we are now going to move on to upper GI foreign bodies and their removal um, this is covered very nicely in this video clip which I will now run, it runs for 12 minutes in adults accidental foreign bodies and B ingestion tends to be food bolus Non-food object ingestions occur more in denture users, psychiatric patients, incarcerated individuals, and alcohol-intoxicated patients. The majority of the ingested FB will pass spontaneously. With therapeutic endoscopy, fewer patients require surgical intervention. Mortality rates are extremely low. Commonly used foreign body retrieval devices include net retriever, snare, basket, rat tooth, shark tooth, and rat tooth alligator jaw, grasper, and pronged grasper. This is net retriever grasping device and pronged grasping device. For a sharp or pointed foreign body, these common mucosa and airway protection devices can be used. Foreign body hood protector, banding device cap, friction fit cap, anoscope, and endoscopic overtube. We are fitting a foreign body hood protector. As the endoscope is withdrawn through a narrow segment, usually at the level of a sphincter, the FB hood protector flips over the grasped foreign body, providing mucosal protection against the moving foreign body. The banding device cap is another inexpensive and versatile device for removing sharp and pointed objects. Endoscopic overtube consists of an outer tube and a proximal obturator. Prior to overtube insertion, the proximal obturator should be pre-inserted inside the overtube and both devices are gently advanced over the inserted endoscope. This will minimize the risk of perforation and mucosal injury. In cases of a pointed foreign body, hood protector, banding device cap, and anoscope can be used for anal canal protection. Once through the esophagus, most FB, including sharp objects, pass uneventfully. Risk factors for perforation include sharp or pointed foreign body, animal or fish bones, and magnets. Imaging studies aid in non-food FB localization and medical documentation. Biplane radiographs identify most non-food FB. In cases of suspected food bolus impaction, a contrast swallow study is generally not recommended because of aspiration risk. Emergent endoscopy should be performed in patients with esophageal obstruction with inability to swallow secretions and with disc batteries and a sharp pointed foreign body in the esophagus.
For food bolus impaction in the esophagus, a combination of piecemeal bolus removal and gentle pushing at the center of the bolus is usually successful and safe. Proteolytic enzymes should never be applied. This patient presented with food bolus impaction with inability to swallow secretions. Using an endoscopic net retriever, the food bolus is removed piecemeal. The tip of the net retriever is placed between the food bolus and the esophageal wall with an open net to capture the top portion of the food bolus. After piecemeal removal, the food bolus can usually be successfully dislodged with gentle pushing at the center of the bolus. The underlying pathology is esophageal inlet segment with associated stricture. This patient inadvertently swallowed a denture and it is impacted within the upper esophagus. He cannot swallow saliva. Emergent endoscopy is performed. The denture is impacted within the esophageal introitus. Attempts should not be made to push down a sharp and impacted object. In this case, we are using an endoscopic grasper to capsule the impacted denture and gently disimpact the object. With a slow pulling force and fine twisting of the endoscope, the impacted denture is removed without event. Endoscopic examination of the upper esophagus and esophageal introitus reveals several ischemic ulcerations from the impacted denture. Once the foreign body is in the stomach, it usually passes in several days. Conservative management is appropriate for most asymptomatic gastric FB. However, endoscopic removal is indicated for sharp FB, FB greater than 6 cm in length, greater than 2.5 cm in diameter, and FB retention in the stomach greater than 3 to 4 weeks. In this case, an intentionally swallowed razor blade is removed endoscopically. Once a foreign body enters the small bowel and is beyond the reach of conventional endoscopy, daily radiographs are needed for sharp pointed FB to ensure its safe passage. This patient unintentionally swallowed a needle and it has migrated into the proximal small bowel. During push enteroscopy, the needle is seen within the proximal jejunum. The pointed tip of the needle is captured with an endoscopic snare. Once the needle is pulled inside the stomach, a banding device cap is used to assist needle removal through the esophagus and larynx. In this patient, a retained capsule endoscope is inside the small bowel. During push enteroscopy, the capsule is seen trapped inside a small bowel diverticulum.
With gentle manipulation, the capsule endoscope is captured with an endoscopic snare. Once the capsule endoscope is pulled into the stomach, an endoscopic net retriever is used to capture the capsule and remove the capsule through the esophagus. A 28-year-old male unintentionally swallowed a razor blade and he was asymptomatic. In the emergency room on KUB, the razor blade can be seen in the left upper quadrant. Emergent upper endoscopy failed to localize the razor blade in the stomach and duodenum. On day three, the razor blade has migrated into the right lower quadrant and into the descending colon in the afternoon. In order to avoid injury within the anal canal or the anal sphincter during spontaneous passage of the razor blade, an unprepped sigmoidoscopy is performed. The razor blade is grasped with an endoscopic grasper. The razor blade is then dropped into the rectal vault. An endoscopic foreign body hood protector was placed on the tip of the endoscope. The razor blade is then removed through the deployed endoscopic hood without causing anal canal injury. Rectal FB are either ingested or inserted through the anus. I need to stop there because um, we have only uh, we only wanted to look at the upper GI endoscopic interventions. Um, another method of removing uh, foreign swallowed foreign bodies, typically coins, um, is to use a Foley catheter and pass it beyond the obstruction, then blow up the bulb and try and gently withdraw the catheter and uh, the dilated balloon frequently dislodges the um, foreign body and you're able to take it out that way. This works very well in children. You've got to be very careful to um, do this within the first 24 hours. You don't want to delay it and do it um, beyond 24 hours because there's a high risk of esophageal perforation. Uh, this video is only two minutes. Okay, so this little guy ingested a coin and it's stuck in his esophagus. You can tell it's in the esophagus because it's transverse on the PA view and on the lateral you see it on edge view. Now, to get the coin out, what we're going to do is pass a Foley catheter beyond the coin, blow the catheter up, and then pull back, and that will dislodge the coin up into the posterior pharynx. Now, when you're getting set to do this, one of the things you can do is fill the catheter with some barium and then pull it back out. And this will leave a thin stream in there. So if there's any question of where the catheter is, you can take a quick x-ray and the Foley catheter will show up because of the lining of the barium that's in it. Now, the goal is to pass the tube through the mouth into the esophagus beyond the coin. And then once it's beyond the coin, you can estimate this by just holding it up to the, the patient. Roll the patient on their side or at least get their head rotated to the side blow the catheter up and generally in the range of three to five cc's is enough for a small child to get it out. A larger child you may need a little bit more. Just pull it, you'll feel a little tug and the coin will come out. Okay, so in this child, the child's been sedated lightly with propofol. Uh, you'll see him struggling a little bit, but that's because we're manipulating him. But if you leave him alone, he will fall asleep. You want him lightly sedated so they don't aspirate the coin when you remove it. Catheter is being passed through the mouth into the esophagus and we estimated about how far it needs to go down. Once we believe we're past that point, we're going to inflate the balloon and then we'll pull back. You'll notice that the child's rotated to the side and the head's rolled to the side. Now what we didn't do was sweep the mouth after we pulled back on the balloon, which you always need to do because sometimes the coin comes out without much resistance. And here, surprise, we noticed that we did get the coin out. It's a pretty simple technique and it works very well. Yeah, that's...
uh, neat video. Um, this video I'm not going to look at, we're running short of time. Uh, we're moving on to endoscopic management of bleeding peptic ulcers. There are a couple of methods that we can use. Uh, please remember the forest classification, which gives one an indication of the re-bleeding rate. And there's categories 1A and 1B, 2A and 2B, and uh, 3. And uh, the different images um, are representative of the different grades. The grade 3 or type 3 are least likely to re-bleed whereas the 1A where there's a spurting bleeder is obviously more likely to re-bleed. Okay, the um, specialized device for bleeding ulcers, uh, the local uh, device that we have is called a Gold Pro. It is a combination catheter which goes down the biopsy channel. The tip has uh, diathermy, um, low energy diathermy so that it doesn't perforate and it also has the ability to suction and irrigate through a channel within that catheter. Okay, so the vessel um, is touched with this uh, diathermy device and then the operator or the surgeon will depress a, a foot pedal and activate the diathermy and co coagulate and hopefully stop the vessel from bleeding. Then you get um, clips. Uh, these are single-use clips. They are unfortunately very expensive because uh, it's not possible to build a device that has uh, multi-clip in uh, which can actually fit down a biopsy channel. So these clips, the last uh, I heard there in the region of one to one and a half thousand rand each uh, per device. It's a single-use um, catheter and clip applier and um, they do work very effectively and if you are able to identify the vessel and clip on either side of the point of bleeding you can get very good um, control of the bleeding ulcer. Okay, so we are, we've looked at a couple of things, esophageal dilatation and stenting, removal of foreign body, endoscopic treatment of bleeding ulcer. I'm going to show you a video of an uh, overscope um, a clip called the Ovesco and um, also a POM and then the endoscopy for corrosive injury of the upper GIT. Okay, the, uh, this is a specialized clip. This clip actually fits over the endoscope on the outside of the endoscope and it is deployed using a similar uh, if you can see that little white, uh, that's a string that runs up through the biopsy channel and just like um, a banding device, when you turn it, it actually activates the clip and it's quite a big bite, a sort of uh, 8 to 9 millimeter uh, diameter bite and it can be very effective in controlling bleeding. Um, the uh, randomized control study comparing Ovesco to standard hemostasis uh, in severe peptic ulcer disease or peptic ulcer bleeding um, shows that the Ovesco um, is far more effective and it has a lower re-bleeding rate. Right, this video shows the setup as well as the use of the Ovesco clip. The OTSC hand wheel is inserted into the rubber valve on the working channel and attached to the endoscope's handhold using the Velcro strap. To apply the OTSC applicator cap to the distal end of the endoscope, the thread is pulled through the working channel of the endoscope using, for example, a forceps.
The thread is attached to the OTSC hand wheel by clamping it in the corresponding gap. By turning the hand wheel away from the endoscope's handle, the thread is wound up. The OTSC applicator cap is positioned in a way that the end of the thread is directly adjacent to the working channel and the thread runs right through the working channel of the endoscope. The thread is further wound up with the hand wheel until mild tension is felt. The OTSC clip is released from the distal end of the endoscope towards the tissue by turning the hand wheel clockwise. The video shows Forest 1A bleeding from a peptic ulcer in the duodenal bulb. The 61-year-old female patient with high-dose NSAID therapy was referred to emergency endoscopy after coffee ground vomiting and hemoglobin dropped to 4.2. In the intensive care unit, endoscopic hemostasis was tried by means of conventional clipping and fibrin glue injection. This was, however, unsuccessful and the patient was transferred to the endoscopy unit. An OTSC 1260 clip is placed after identifying the duodenal bleeding site and tissue management by means of endoscopic suction. Immediate hemostasis is achieved. Okay, so that shows the OVESCO clip. Uh, we're going to now look at the endoscopic treatment of bleeding varices. Uh, remember the uh, abnormal vasculature. Uh, Unfortunately, in this diagram, it's shown in red, uh, but bear in mind that this is obviously venous uh, structure, so it should typically be shown in blue. But there is a portosystemic circulation connection at the OG junction, and it is because of this um, connection and the pressure in the portal system that the varices develop. You have typically esophageal varices in portal hypertension. There may also be gastric varices. Esophageal varices can be treated um, with esophageal uh, variceal uh, banding. Okay, this is um, image sequence of images showing a uh, highly active bleeding esophageal varix, which is then uh, capped using a suction cap and a banding device. Uh, bands are applied, and the bleeding is under control. Right, the technique for ligation of esophageal varices to protect the airway whenever there is severe active bleeding. Uh, band actively bleeding esophageal varices first or use sclerotherapy. Then band each esophageal variceal column within 2 cm of the gastroesophageal junction. Uh, lastly, um, band each esophageal varix 5 to 7 cm proximal to the gastroesophageal junction and the goal is to place two bands on each varix column. Okay, so it's very important to uh, realize that there's a very specific method of applying these bands. And uh, if you don't do it in this method, there's a high risk of re-bleeding. Okay, this is a brief six minute video which shows you the application of esophageal variceal bands.
the initial endoscopy is done without the um, bend applicator device on because if it was applied you should see the uh, cap okay so this is just the initial diagnostic endoscopy all the way down to d2 there's large vessels there and they are questioning whether they are gastric antral variceal disease a retroflex uh, view of the OG junction. There's the varices. The red whale sign. Drawing the scope, they're then going to apply um, the banding device, which has a suction cap at the end, applied to the end of the endoscope. There we see it in place. And the string device here, as shown here, allows the bands, which are actually on the outside of that plastic suction cap, uh, to be deployed very clever little device which uh, allows you to apply up to six bands right, there's the barracks being sucked in you don't see anything and the surgeon then turns the dial and activates the band or applies the band and there we can see the esophageal varics with the band on it right, there's the band not so easy to see with everything in the way applying another band So remember from the text just now, the idea is to apply uh, at least two bands to each column of vertices. see the band, black rubber band supplied, multiple points, very effective. And then they've reloaded another six bands. last band to be applied now, 12th band see all these um, Varices, 
constricted basically what happens now they um, will slowly necrose and slough off and in doing so they will fibrose and they are less likely to rebleed. Okay, uh, the actively spurting esophageal varus may be difficult to bend. Sclerotherapy is easier uh, but it is more difficult to actually succeed in controlling the bleeding. Uh, it is important to inject all columns starting at the OG junction and then every 2 to 2.5 centimeters above the OG junction otherwise there is a risk of re-bleed. You will note from the previous video that the varices in this patient extended approximately for 20 centimeters so with sclerotherapy you've got to inject every 2 to 2.5 centimeters so that would be possibly 8 to 10 um, injections on each column of varices. Banding on the other hand is more difficult to perform but more likely to be successful. Each column must be banded at the OG junction and then 5 to 7 centimeters above the OG junction to prevent bleeding. So that's two bands for each column and in the previous patient they applied 12 bands so there were really a large number of columns and the columns were quite extensive uh, going 20 centimeters proximally. Okay, just some stats on uh, primary hemostasis rates for cirrhotics with active bleeding variceal hemorrhage. 90% um, for banding alone, 95% for sclerotherapy alone, 98% for superglue and combination therapy it's possible to get 100% uh, reduction in re-bleeding. Uh, variceal portal hypertension, upper GI bleed Doppler. Uh, primary outcome of the same lesion 30 days uh, after rebleed. Stigmata such as active bleed or platelet plugs, red spots or whales or clean varix and these are associated with 53% um, rebleed, 23.3 and 36.4. Okay. Early rebleeding in cirrhotics with severe upper GI hemorrhage uh, occurs unless all esophageal varices in the distal 5 to 7 centimeters of the esophagus are obliterated which is why the bands are placed as such and the obliteration often takes 4 to 5 sessions um, every 6 to 8 weeks with sclerotherapy or banding. Combination sclerotherapy and banding can significantly reduce the number of sessions to variceal obliteration and early re-bleeding rates. There is of course the risk of failure of endoscopic therapy um, the inability to control active esophageal variceal hemorrhage within 30 minutes of therapeutic endoscopy, severe complication of endoscopic treatment such as perforation or severe secondary ulcer hemorrhage, um, recurrent esophageal variceal bleeding which was not controlled by two endo treatments or more than six um, transfusions, that's uh, packed cells, hemorrhage from varices that are not esophageal, for example gastric varices, and death from esophageal varix hemorrhage, the result of failure of treatment. Okay, we're done with uh, the um, bleeding, and we now move on to POEM, which is per oral endoscopic myotomy for achalasia. Right, this is a nice eight minute video, which explains it very clearly. In this video, we'd like to talk about the lessons learned endoscopic myotomy procedure after a failed Heller myotomy for the treatment of achalasia. Achalasia is treated primarily with a laparoscopic Heller myotomy with or without a partial fundoplication. It is a standard of care. It has excellent short-term and long-term palliation. The procedure is performed by creating a myotomy or cutting the muscle on the lower esophageal sphincter. This usually starts several centimeters above the esophageal junction and traverses to the stomach for several centimeters, for usually about five to six centimeters in total length. Both the longitudinal fibers as well as the circular fibers are cut, allowing the spasms in the lower subtle sphincter to be relieved, the uh, distal obstruction is relieved. So this is an interoperative picture showing a, a myotomized lower subtle sphincter, showing it to be widely patent, at least as it appears on the outside. An emerging technology for the treatment of surgical treatment of achalasia is per oral endoscopic myotomy or the POEM procedure. It has excellent results as for a short term palliation. Um, however, long term data, 5, 10 year, 15 year data are not available as 
because it's a relatively new procedure. So these are some of the steps of the standard poem procedure, which we're going to show in our video that's coming up in the next slide. So the steps for a poem procedure are as follows. A submucosal injection is created to separate the mucosa and the submucosal layer from the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscular layer. The mucosotomy, or the opening in the, in the mucosa and the submucosa, is created for usually for about one to two centimeters to facilitate the entrance of the endoscope into the tunnel. The creation of a submucosal tunnel from the area of the mucosotomy through the lower subgeal sphincter onto several centimeters of the stomach. At the completion of the creation of the tunnel, we recommend a verification of the integrity of the submucosal flap prior to performing a myotomy. So once the flap has been found to be intact, then a myotomy is performed for the usual a five to eight centimeters, traversing the lower subgeal sphincter or the GE junction to make sure there's an adequate myotomy and prevent inadequate or insufficient myotomy. And lastly, once the uh, myotomy is complete, the closure of the mucosotomy is so this is a short video of a standard poem procedure that we perform. The area has already been injected with methylene blue. We're using a triangle tip knife to create the mucosotomy. Because the area has been previously injected, we'll be able to see that even though the knife is going in, there's a substantial distance between the mucosa and the muscle. And the injection also provides a uh, difference in contrast that facilitates uh, dis distinguishing the various layers. And once you get far enough in the tunnel where the prior injection has worn off, we'll be able to then see the clear tissue, which we once again have to re-inject with methylene blue to recreate the contrast between the tissues. In addition to providing better visualization, the hydrostatic pressure allows some dissection as well. And once that's done between a combination of the tension created by the, the cap on the endoscope as well as the electrocautery, we create the tunnel. Once the tunnel is complete, here we're cutting the muscle. You can see that the circular muscle is separate from the longitudinal muscle, so if one chooses a, uh, just a circular myotomy can be done without having to cut the longitudinal, although we recommend a full thickness myotomy. The mucosotomy is uh, closed with endoscopic clips, and um, at the completion of the uh, closure, we examine the clips to make sure there's not a significant space between the clips. Performing poem procedures after laparoscopic hemorrhoidotomy, it's important to understand the anatomy of the prior surgery. And in a laparoscopic operation, the anterior surface of the esophageal wall at the lower esophageal sphincter is the one that's been previously myotomized. So it's not an area you want to be in, both from the scarring purposes as well as the fact that there isn't the separation of layers. So we recommend the 5 o'clock position, which works very well. This also works in patients who've had a thoracic color myotomy where the previous myotomy has been in the left side or in the lateral aspect. Therefore, the same five o'clock position seems to work. This is a comparison video of an easily separating muscle layer from the submucosal layer. In fact, it almost looks like it separates with just pressure. If you look at the, sub the scarring in the redo setting, it takes a lot of meticulous dissection to be able to separate the muscle layer. So some of the maneuvers that we've come to overcome the scar are as follows. Cut the muscle to progress the tunnel in areas where there's significant scarring to create a new tunnel in a 90 degree plane from the previous tunnel in the event that you had accidentally spiraled and entered into an area of scar. So this provides a new trajectory for you to access the virgin plane. A shorter tunnel to prevent spiraling. We can repeat injections with greater frequency to use the methylene blue and its hydrostatic pressure to separate the layer. In this video, we're showing the, the benefit of the second tunnel. So we're in the second tunnel at this point. We'll be able to see that we've been able to get into a plane that facilitates the procedure. The muscle is now separating. The previous tunnel was very similar to the scar that we saw in the video earlier. So here we can see the two sets of clips suggesting the two tunnels and the scope is about to go through the lower esophageal sphincter and we'll find that it will be widely paid. Of note, this patient had a substantially uh, sigmoidal esophagus that probably led to some spiraling. Injection.
conditions. In this image, we can see that the planes are not as clear. The submucosa, which is this bottom of the screen, is very close to the muscle layer, which is on top. The injection that is now being performed allows both the visualization as well as the physical separation. Now, it's that same image now that after the injection has been done, we can now see that the planes are separate. We can now see a different uh, differentiation between the muscular layer and the submucosal layer and allows us to be able to dissect safely. In this video, we're showing a uh, very difficult case where we had a significant amount of scarring of the lower subject sphincter. We can see the, the perforation there. In fact, you can see one of the surgical clips from the previous heller myotomy. This, these patients are often, frankly, perforated in the abdomen as there's a layer of scar surrounding this. Now, this could also be in the fundoplication. So in either case, we look for a pneumoperitoneum. In the absence of a pneumoperitoneum, they're usually safe. This patient was observed for several days without any complications, and so it started on a liquid diet and discharged without permission. If there happens to be a perforation in an area where you could see, it's obviously easy to clip. So this patient had a perforation on the gastric side, and we were able to see it on retroflexion, and we were able to clip it. This was actually identified originally from the tunnel. Of note, you can see the space between the scope and the esophageal wall suggesting a very adequate myotomy. The pre and post time barium shows a significant improvement. So in summary, the poem procedure after the Heller myotomy is safe with minimal morbidity. The symptom improvement is excellent. However, radiographic changes on time barium esophagrams do not always show as significant a change or a significant improvement as people feel from a symptomatic standpoint. Their Eckhart scores are much improved relative to their time barium. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, video clip on the POEM procedure. Um, I'm not aware this is being done uh, anywhere in KZN. It may be done elsewhere in the country. Um, and the last uh, topic that we're going to cover briefly is corrosive injury of the upper GIT. Generally, the endoscopy is a um, diagnostic endoscopy um, without um, any intervention possible. Uh, it's got to be done very carefully and uh, you risk uh, perforating the esophagus so you only proceed if you can see the lumen and you can see in this instance there's been fairly extensive corrosive ingestion injury Withdrawing the scope. Very extensive injury. The treatment of these patients, um, generally it's not safe to try and pass a nasogastric feeding tube. Um, you may have to uh, resort to TPN. Um, you may have to consider doing a feeding jejunostomy. And um, once the uh, esophagus is healed, it unfortunately has a very high incidence of stricture and then one would have to decide whether you'd be able to possibly dilate these strictures or if it's fairly extensive and severe, one would consider an esophagectomy. Um, remember with benign disease, um, you can bypass the esophagus without the need.